Hey everyone, Joshua Gibson here, and you're listening to episode 44 of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. Before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to the show's sponsor, Bar Shield. Bar Shield created a maintenance kit designed to prevent rust and restore spin to a barbell's sleeve. My discount code, PWPODCAST, will get you 10% off of your entire purchase. It will also help me to continue producing great podcasts with amazing guests. Head over to BarShieldUSA.com, pick up a kit, and get your bars spinning and looking like new. That's it for the intro. Now let's get on to this week's podcast with Amy Anaya Everett. And we are live. Today I'm joined by Amy Anaya Everett, weightlifter coach and the second half of Catalyst Athletics. Amy, thank you for joining me, and how are you doing today? Thank you for having me. I'm pretty amazing so far. Yeah? Well, yeah. luckily it's early for you, so I think you have some good mojo going into the day. Yeah, I think I'm off to a good, pretty good start. One thing that um, kind of surprised me, and maybe people listening, is that you've had a, a big part of the development of Catalyst Athletics. Um, so when exactly did you? I know you're married to Greg, but when did you guys meet, and what does the development of Catalyst look like since then? Um, well, we met about 13 years ago, and at the time, Greg was still with, uh, partnered with Rob Wolf. They own the fourth ever CrossFit affiliate, the original CrossFit NorCal, and he was working there partnered with Rob Wolf and running the performance menu. And about six months after I met him, he moved to San Diego to come and kind of be mentored by coach Bergner. And, um, he sold out of his share of the gym at that time. So he kind of took the performance menu and Rob kept the gym. And then shortly after that is when he started catalyst athletics. And at first it was just his, and then he hired me. I started working for him and just kind of started running the business side of things. And he, you know, that way he could focus on projects and more, you know, the information that's on the website and the content. And then shortly after that, we decided to move to the Bay Area and open a gym. And then that's really when it took off. Okay. And I know that you've you've been a great weightlifter in your own right, and I also know that you've been a great coach and still are um, still are a great coach. And it's kind of a surprise to me that you're not like I haven't seen as many like podcasts with you featured or just as much information kind of put out there. It seems like you're a little more behind the scenes, which might be changing. Um, maybe you could give us an idea of how you got into weightlifting, how your weightlifting career went, and then um, why you decided to coach? Well, I think for Catalyst, definitely I'm more behind the scenes lately, especially because um, we don't have a gym now. And so Catalyst Athletics is really known for our online content, and, and that is all provided by Greg. And so I do the whole business side of Catalyst Athletics, and he's the face of Catalyst Athletics. So that's probably why I'm not really out there for Catalyst Athletics, whereas more people approach him because he is the author of all the content and creates all of that. So people want to speak to him about that. Um, But I do coach some of the weightlifting team, you know. And... Sorry, I totally answered the wrong question. Oh, what was no, the question? that was great. Uh, that was great. <laughs> that was, that's really insightful because um, I know you were on the business side, but I feel like, I mean, obviously just from the outset in your own right, you seem like an incredibly uh, knowledgeable person when it comes to weightlifting, developing weightlifters. And, and the reason I wanted to bring you on is your, the way you approach coaching athletes. I think it's um, a little bit different um, you know, I, I kind of have this idea when I think of a weightlifting coach as like this stoic um, figure that kind of just sits there and watches and maybe says one or two words and you're a little more um, a little more outspoken, a little more emotional, at, at least it seems. Now, I actually find that a bit more attractive. Um, oh, thank you. So that's why I yeah. kind of... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Um, I think that um, I learned a lot of this from my longtime coach, who's like my father, Coach Bergner. And he really, he didn't coach everyone this way, but he really coached his kids with his soul. And because I was considered one of his kids and, and the people that he really took in, he, he coached with everything he had. Hmm. So it wasn't just a technical cue over here or there, or, you know, your typical coach, maybe you see that just writes a program and sends them on their way. Like he gave all of himself to me. And that was not only in the gym while I was on the platform, but that was in life as well. And when he became really famous in CrossFit and got really busy and I was still kind of an, I was still competing as an elite athlete. I moved over to Bob Morris, who was the, at the time he was the coach at the Olympic training center. And so it made sense for me to be, to be with him because I was at the training center a lot anyway. And, you know, he knew me and, and knew my movement and we had a great relationship. And so he took over my coaching in the second half of the career. And then coach Bergner was just able to be my father at that point. And Bob, he is one of the smartest men I've ever met when it comes to weightlifting and, and his programming is incredible and genius and his technical cues are genius. And he taught me the whole other side of coaching. He taught me the, you know, how to have a better eye and how to really feel my body in space and, and feel when I was making technical errors. And he really helped me become a master technician and, and really learn about programming. And so between the two of them, that's kind of the coaching style that I developed. Um, I really pride myself in my programming. I think that I'm a great programmer. I, um, it comes very naturally to me and I trust my intuition and I'm very smart at it. Um, but that comes from years and years of learning and absorbing and, you know, watching how my husband coaches his athletes and, watching what works, what worked for me and what worked for my best friend, Natalie Bergner, an Olympian and, you know, just absorbing all around me. And I'm really lucky that it came so naturally to me because some, some people programming is very hard for them. They just don't get it. Um, so my, my coaching, that's where my coaching style comes from. But I really think a such a strong, what the public sees of me is how I coach with my soul and my emotion and how I love with everything I have for my athletes. And they don't see the hours that I sit at my desk analyzing and um, planning and making plans. And, and, you know, even my athletes don't know that I do that, that I sit and I review videos and, and kind of come up with programs to, um, help them become better. One of the things with my old athlete, Jessica Lucero that I would do is I didn't want her to think about so much in the gym and have to give her so many technical cues in the gym. So I would analyze her videos. You know, she lived with us. So when she went to bed, I would analyze her videos and kind of sit in my office in the quiet and review her movement and, and form her program in ways to fix different technical cues or kind of strengthen things that I saw that were a weakness so that she didn't even know that I was doing that so that she could just go in the gym and focus on her training and not have to have a million cues in her head. And I do that now, you know, with my CrossFit games athlete, Cody, there's some different things this past season that I really wanted to work on. And rather than filling his head with more information that he needed, like I want them to be able to go into a training session and focus on their work and try to do that the best that they can. And so the, the easier I can make that on them, I feel the better their training session will be. And so, you know, sometimes of course I do tell them like, Oh, you've really been on your toes today. But if there's something else that I want to work on, I kind of just incorporate that into their program so that it's strengthening something that I see as a weakness 
or they maybe feel is a weakness, but it's not something they have to think about, if that makes sense. So a lot of times things are fixed without them even knowing that I'm fixing something. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, makes so, a, that makes a lot of sense. And there's actually so much there that I, I would love to, to unpack, but I feel like it, it'd probably be appropriate to, um, before we get into the coaching, just discuss your time as a weightlifter because I listened yeah. to the Brute Strength podcast with you on there and like I was, I was insta- instantly captivated kind of by, by your story and I think it would be almost a disservice not to share that with the people that listen to this podcast. Um, so maybe if you can just discuss your introduction to the sport, whatever you find relevant before that, and then how weightlifting has kind of shaped you as a person. Um, so I got into the sport because I, the day after I graduated high school, I packed up my little Honda Prelude and I moved away from my parents' house. Um, and I went my, I was lucky enough to have my aunt let me stay with her for a little while until I could get a job and afford my own apartment. Back then apartments were so cheap. It was $425 a month for my one bedroom apartment. Um, and I was going to go to college to Long Beach state and I was going to play volleyball and I had this big plan. Well, during the time that I was living with my aunt, I had joined a summer team, like a summer volleyball team for fun. And the coach of that team was like, gosh, you know, you have such a great vertical jump. You're this skinny little thing. How can you jump so high? Uh, Because I was an outside hitter and a blocker, but I'm only 5'6". But I have, you know, I have a good vertical jump and, and I had a lot of power in my legs, but I was skinny little thing. I'd never worked out in a gym in my life. I just, (laughs) I don't know why I could jump so well. And so he said, I really want to send you to my friend, Mike Bergner. He trains a lot of volleyball players. And I think that it would really be good to put some weight on you and kind of develop some strength. And so I went up there to his house and I just fell in love with the sport. I fell, I fell in love with the family and I was like, this stuff is so cool. And so I just stayed there forever, like a barnacle that attaches itself to a boat. And I didn't, I didn't go to that – I didn't I didn't go to college. I didn't play volleyball anymore. I quit volleyball the next day. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. So what were some highlights of your athletic career? Uh, maybe competitive moments that stick out and maybe just uh, moments in training that stick out. Uh, well, I think, um, I think that I was lucky enough to have a really, a a pretty successful weightlifting career, but it didn't go where it should have gone. And it's because I just wasn't motivated enough. And that sounds really shitty, but, um, my friend, Natalie, she's the 2008 Olympian. She used to say, why don't you just want it a little more? Like, like I look at you and you just cruise along at 90% and you know, not literally 90% weight, but like 90% effort and you're so good. And if you would just want it, you would be so much better than me. She used to tell me that all the time. It would drive her crazy. And at the time I didn't see it. I'd be like, what do you mean? I am trying hard, but I really wasn't trying hard. It's kind of like when you're in school and you can fuck off all day and still get straight A's. (laughs) Yeah. And so you don't put in the extra effort or to study because you're like, well, I'm getting an A anyways. Why should I spend five hours studying? That was me. And it's really shitty to say, but like, I didn't want it. I I love the sport and I love lifting and I love being around the friends, but I didn't have like aspirations to be an Olympian. And like, it, it just, that wasn't important to me. What was more important was the sense of family that I had in weightlifting and my love for the barbell and my love for the platform. And, and I was okay and content with what I had, Hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't want to go further than where I was. And I mean, of course everyone's like, yeah, I mean, I would be like, yeah, I would love to go to the Olympics, but I wasn't willing to put in the work and I just didn't want it as bad as other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. 
And so um, I think, you know, like little moments are the highlight of my career. Like when I snatched 95, you know, things that I remember is getting up at four in the morning and flying to the Olympic Training Center to be on time for 10 a.m. training and being so tired, not eaten, but so excited to be there with my coach Bob and my friend Natalie and and snatch 95. Mm. That's the thing that I'm like, that was so badass. You know, of course, my 2000, 2007 Nationals was a highlight of my career because I had a great meet. It was all PRs. And I beat Kara Heads, who is an Olympian. And I and after, someone had told me that I was the first American to ever beat her. She'd only ever been beaten internationally. She had never been beaten here in America, like at, you know, in American competitions. And so that was really cool. You know, those are the things that I remember that are, that I consider the highlight of my career, like with making a world team that it wasn't like the most exciting thing for me. Mm -hmm. The more exciting things for me were like little battles that I was able to accomplish myself. Like one time I was in the gym and I remember it, it's when I was trying to PR 83 and coach Bergner's like, you're going to stay here all day until you make this snatch. And I was crying and tears running down my face. And, and it was like 15 snatches in. He's like, I'm leaving. I have things to do. I'm going to go. <laughs> and he's like walking to the car. And as he was walking to the car, I nailed the snatch. Like those things, that's, those are the important things to me. And the reason those are so important to me is because those little small victories taught me how to be tough and taught me how to, to train with grit and tenacity. And those are things that I'm so thankful for because those lessons taught me to be a better coach. Like I really think I was meant to be a coach. I wasn't meant to be a weightlifter as an athlete because I'm so much happier seeing my athletes succeed than I ever was at myself succeeding. Mm -hmm. So kind of looking on, at the opposite end of that, what were some of the toughest moments of your weightlifting career, um, competitive or, or uh, at, a, at a competition or in training? Wait, can you repeat that? Sorry. What, what were some of the, the most difficult parts um, of your, your competitive career? Definitely working through injuries, mm. I think. You know, because while I say that it wasn't important for me to, you know, go to the Olympics or whatever, it was important for me to not get beat. <laughs> like I didn't I didn't like losing, you know? And so whenever I had injuries coming up to a competition, I that was the most frustrating for me because it totally derails you. And, and it was really hard at the time and it's emotional and you cry and I put in all this work and now I can't do anything. And that, that was real crippling. I think that was the hardest part for me is working through injuries and learning how to work through injuries. But again, I'm so thankful for those moments because it taught me how to be better for my athletes. Yeah, exactly. And, and looking back on that for people listening that may be going through something similar um, they're injured and maybe can't do the competitive lifts or they have to alter their training. I mean, what would you say to them to help not only motivate them through this time of injury, but almost change the way they look at an injury to see it more as an opportunity um, versus uh, something that's that's more negative? I think that what I've learned through being an athlete and, and seeing and then now being a coach is that when you get injured, there's typically always a million other things that you can do. And I think that one of the biggest lessons is when to push and when not to push. And if you don't have to push and you can take the time to take a step back and, you know, reevaluate your training and to allow that body part to heal, then that's going to benefit you because instead of taking – you know, maybe you have to take four days off to let something rest. It's better than pushing through it and then taking four weeks off. I think what I see a lot of times is 
people get hurt and they have this sense of urgency, like, oh my gosh, I can't miss training. What's going to happen? And so they keep pushing through it. And then it turns into a real injury to where they're out for months. Whereas if they would have just taken those few days off, then it probably wouldn't have turned into something so huge. And I learned that uh, one time my hip was really hurting and my My chiropractor finally said, you know, you need to take three days off. Like, don't even go into the gym. You need to take three days off where you're not moving this hip. Like, I can't get ahead of it because you're going in and beating it up every day. And I left the office and I cried and cried. I called Bob and cried. And I have to take three days off. What's (laughs) going to happen? It's going to ruin my career. We have nationals in five weeks. And he's like, Amy, it's three days. You're not going to lose anything in three days. And I listened to him and um, it was all better. Whereas another time my hip was hurting, um, I actually tore my hip Mm. and Mm. my doctor's like, you need to take two months off. You can't be on this hip. And, you know, he talked to coach Bergner and this was when I was still with coach Bergner and Greg and, you know, she can't be training. You have to keep her out of the gym. She can't even do push presses or anything, nothing. Like I couldn't do anything. And I would sneak to the gym. When Coach Bergner was working, he'd be at RBB High School. He was still working at that time. I would go sneak up to the house when nobody knew I was there. And I would train. <laughs> it just got worse and worse. And then I really screwed myself up. So you learn, you know? Yeah. And I guess that's kind of where the art of coaching is, is being able to talk an athlete off of a ledge uh, during a period of uh, difficulty like that. But do you think there's kind of the flip side of that where the normal aches and pains of training, do you have to ever have a conversation with an athlete like, hey, this is okay to push through? Um, and then how, how do you go about convincing them that training's going to hurt, training's going to be difficult, but... Uh, eventually just pushing through this is going to end up in the long run being more beneficial than it will detrimental. Of course. I mean that, you know, I tell my athletes all the time, you're going to, as long as you're an athlete, you're going to hurt. You'll stop hurting when you retire. Yeah. Like there's always going to be something you're going to wake up and your knee's going to be achy or your elbow or your wrist or shit. My back locked up or your hip or what. Like you're never going to be void of hurting because you're beating your body up every day. And this is for my weightlifters and my CrossFitters. And so, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, this is hurting my hamstring. And I say, okay, does it hurt? Like, is it, does it feel like it's going to rip off or is it just kind of sore and achy because of X, Y, and Z we did yesterday? Oh, it's just really sore. Okay. Well then you can train. You know, but if they feel, oh my, it just, it's, you know, they, I teach them to know the difference of something they can push through because it's like soreness or kind of achy and hurting or something that's like, okay, we need to be careful for this. And, you know, Cody, for example, we're getting ready for the games and, you know, he, he's really learned to tell me which it took a long time because before he would just work through anything because he didn't want to speak up and say something was hurting. And I, I told him, you have to tell me if something's hurting so that we can change things up or work around it because there's no point in working through an injury unless it's like the week of the games, mm-hmm. you know? And so don't try to be a hero. That's what I always say. Why are you trying to be a hero right now? If you're, if this, if, whatever dumbbell power jerks hurt, then we'll switch it to something else, you know? And so I think it's really important. And I, I really try hard to teach them early on to communicate with me. And there's, there's times where I'll say, do it anyway. There are definitely times like, okay, well we have to do this anyway. Tell me if it gets worse in the middle of a workout or if your wrist is hurting in a snatch. Okay, well, wrap it up. We're going to do these, this snatch workout anyways. You only have seven snatches. You know, so there's different, definitely times, but that's, that's part of a coach knowing their athlete, knowing when you can push them, when you need to back them off, and being able to read their facial cues, I think, and their body language. Because by being able to read 
you know, if they tell me their wrist is hurting, but they're not, their body and their facial cues or body language shows differently, then I'm going to tell them to keep going. But if they're like, you know, grimacing every time they receive, then I know things are different. So as a coach, you have to just know your athlete and pay attention to how their body moves. If they're, you know, I know how every one of my athletes move so well that if they move differently, then some, then I'll ask them like, Hey, is your hip hurting today? Because you know, you're moving differently or is your knee hurting or whatever it is. And they'll say, yeah, it is hurting today <laughs> or whatever, or no, it's not. And then I'll be like, okay, well then clean up your shit because <laughs> it seems like you're, you're hurting. Yeah, I agree completely. And there are a, 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 like certain things I kind of use as an indicator of needing to pull back. And that's if the injury gets worse to worse from, from workout to workout. Or if it, like you said, changes the way you move within a workout, um, which you don't want. But that, like when you brought up Cody, um, I thought that would be a good opportunity to discuss differences between men and women, um, your coaching. Do you find that there's a different approach that needs to be taken between genders or that it's kind of just like individual specific and that each person needs something. I'm sorry. Can you totally hear that weed whacker? Yeah, I can now. Is it totally going to F up our whole podcast? Oh no, it's fine. Okay. Sorry guys. <laughs> um, I don't know. I d- that whole gender difference bullshit just really pisses me off. Like there are, yes, there are differences, but I don't like baby or coddle my girls because they're a girl. I think the difference between that. One of the main differences between my male and female athletes is my females show their emotion more than my males. So, you know, Cody's not going to cry in the middle of a workout if things are going bad, but one of my girls may cry. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. But I still push them equally as hard, but I'm a girl and I have a lot of emotions, Mm. a lot of them. Like every fucking emotion there is, I have it. (laughs) And so I know how to deal with my girls, but that, but boys have emotions as well. It's just, just show it in a different way. And so, again, I think that's just part of knowing your athlete and, you know, knowing where their mindset is and where their focus is and what emotion they're having that's disrupting their workout. And I I tell every one of my athletes, male or female, that emotions in sport make you stronger hmm. and use it as fuel. If you're feeling pissed, use this fuel. If you're feeling emotional, use it as fuel. If your boyfriend broke up with you, use it as fuel. Like turn all of those emotions into the power you need to make a lift or get a faster time on your workout. That's what I teach my athletes. That's that's phenomenal. And I guess I can take this as an opportunity to um, ask you how to deal with ath- like female athletes um, specifically that do show their emotions more in a workout. So, um, for example, I had an athlete that her, her front squats were going just not, not really well or up to her standard. And she was kind of having like an emotional breakdown. And you know, as, as a, as a male, I don't know how to deal with that. So what advice would you give to the male coaches listening who also coach female athletes and want to be there when they are, um, experiencing those difficulties? I, I mean, my best advice is to tell them it's okay to be emotional. Mm. I think a lot of males, and and this is actually something that Coach Bergner used to have a really hard time with with me and Sage, is when we would cry in the gym or get really emotional, he'd get mad at us and and cuss and what the fuck is going on and man up. And, you know, but he has that military sense and he had to kind of learn and adjust with us. And when you're, when a female is shamed for being emotional, it will, it will make her lose trust in her coach. Hmm. 
Mm. I really believe that. If a, if a male coach shames, shames a female for showing emotion, it's going to make her clam up and, and lose trust. And every coach has to develop empathy. And, and that includes understanding that your females are going to get emotional, especially maybe around their period or, um, and to me, females get emotional because they care. And, and if they're getting emotional about their front squats, um, it's different if they're throwing a tantrum and throwing plates and screaming and yelling, that's a time where you need to be like, look, you need to tidy up your shit here and get a hold of yourself. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to say, Hey, it's okay to be emotional. If you have to cry while you're doing these front squats, then cry. If you need to step outside and take a minute and compose yourself, then that's okay too. It's, it's okay to show emotion and that means you care and let's figure out a way to use that motive, that, that emotion as motivation rather than it using it to hinder your performance. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, I was actually just having this discussion with um, one of my buddies. He actually lives in New Zealand and he was saying that there's not a lot of information over there. Um, like, he needed help coaching uh, female athletes, basically, and I, I thought this was a great opportunity to have you on, and it seems like you have a ton of insight. Uh, so I just want to thank you again for this, uh, because oh, yeah. this, this is really good information. Um, I, I'm kind of curious to hear how your coaching approach changes from s beginners to intermediates to advanced. Do you have a different approach you take with each different skill level? And um, I, I guess I can let you answer that. Uh, no, I don't. I treat every one of my athletes like they're world champions. Like if they're the worst athlete in the world and they're never going to make it to a local competition, I don't treat them like they're a shitty athlete that's never going to make it. Like every athlete is important and, and every athlete's goals are important, whether that is a goal just to be in shape so they can chase around their grandkids or be in shape so they can go to the Olympics. Like it's still a goal and it's still important. And so I don't treat my athletes differently. That being said, I am harder on my competitive athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, I put more weight on things, meaning if my, you know, if my athlete who's a grandpa misses or misses training or, um, you know, is having a bad day, then it's not really a big deal compared to a elite athlete. Like I come down on them. Like, why are you missing training? Right. So I'm not gonna, how do I put this? Everyone I treat with the same respect and, and I don't downgrade anyone's goals or think anyone's goals are less important because it's not something like the Olympics or the CrossFit games, because some people will never go to the Olympics or the CrossFit games, but I don't want them to think that they're not important to me. Right. However, my elite athletes will definitely get more of me in that they require more attention. Some coaches think that the more elite the athlete, the less attention they need. And I disagree with that. I think the more elite the athlete is, the more attention they need. Because how how do you have an elite athlete who's already so good and you have to make them better? Right? right? You have to you have to give them an edge. How do you do that? Well, you have to spend more time with them. You have to not only make them better in the gym, but make them help them become better people all around. So my elite athletes definitely get more there. I expect more from them. Um, I'm more demanding of how they're spending their days and of their recovery and how they're eating. Whereas my non elite athletes, I don't, I'm not like that. I'm not like, not like, okay, well make sure you get this amount of sleep or you don't do this or no drinking for the next four weeks. You know, I don't, I don't do that with my non-elite athletes. So that's really where my differences come. It's not 
how I treat them in regards to respect or whatever, they're still equals to me. I'm totally talking in circles because I can't explain this well. No, no, no. That was, that was, that was perfectly understandable. And I think it, it comes down to the ability of the athlete to communicate their expectations with the coach um, and, and fulfilling the other side of that. So if you, if you come to a coach and say, hey, I, I want to go to the Olympics, you're going to be treated like that. And whether you're a beginner, or intermediate, or advanced athlete, um, so making those clear from the beginning is very important in setting, um, setting the standard for how the coach treats you inside and outside of the gym. And you were saying that advanced athletes don't need as much, um, as much like hands on. I, I feel like inside the gym, maybe they don't need as many like technical cues. Um, but outside of the gym, it's, it's even more important to, to say, Hey, are you sleeping enough? Are you eating enough? Are you recovering well? Um, would, would you agree with that? Or do you feel like advanced athletes, even in the gym, need the, the coach's eye constantly on them to make sure they're performing up to, to, to the standard? I mean, I believe it does. I, I believe that. I mean, I watch – I'm going to talk about Cody right now because we're, get, we're leading to the games in three weeks. And I'm there for every single one of his workouts, and I watch every single one of his reps. Mm. I mean, there's maybe a time where I look away or if he's on the bike, then I don't give a shit. But I'm watching how his body moves because I need to know where he breaks down, where his movement breaks down. Um, you know, does it does he start to fatigue around minute eight, uh, rep 45, you know, because that's going to make me a better coach for him. If I just stop watching him the minute he starts doing his Metcons or it, then I'm ignoring so much valuable information that I can use to be a better coach for him. And it's the same for weightlifters, the elite weightlifters. I think that for weightlifting, there's as the more elite they get, I definitely think the we don't stop and do technique sessions as much. You know, we kind of, tweak and revamp and kind of do things as we go. Whereas beginner weightlifters more need a lot more technique sessions, specifically technique sessions. And then, you know, but as an, an ask, if elite athlete is something's feeling off or something's, you know, not going well, then if an elite athlete comes to you and says, Hey, you know, I'm really feeling like my snatch is struggling. Maybe like, could can we have a couple technique sessions? Then I think that that's totally cool. Or if a coach says, Hey, you know, something's been going on with your jerk. Let's have a couple technique sessions. So there's a little bit of difference there, but that doesn't mean if an elite athlete is training, I'm still not watching every lift because yeah. you, because the thing is, be, here's the thing. Beginners, they just naturally progress. You know, mm -hmm. they get a little faster every week or they, you know, CrossFitters, they'll get a little fat. They, they naturally progress. They P beginners PR every week and they think that they're going to PR every week for the rest of their life. And all of a sudden you become elite and you may not PR for a year or two years. And so how are you going to make that elite athlete get better? It, you have to continue to improve on technique. You have to continue to improve on on movement. You have to continue to get better. And so in order to do that, you do have to be aware of their movement every day, all year around. So if, if, if you had a beginner that is making progress every, every week and suddenly they're, they're making the transition to an intermediate um, level athlete where the, the progress is a little fewer and far between – What's the conversation look like to keep them in the sport? Because I know that's a period where a lot of people, once they stop making progress, they kind of, they lose the allure of, of weightlifting and, and personal records. And then suddenly their training kind of suffers. What's the, the conversation look like to say, hey, that the, hun the honeymoon period is over and now it's to the grindstone? Well, I think that for me personally, I don't really have that conversation. Because here's the thing, those beginners who are, you know, they're PRing all the time and they're loving it. And they, by the time they get to the inter intermediate stage, they have a love affair with the mm. sport. They've already fallen in love with the sport. And so 
if they're if they've already fallen in love with the sport, they're in it and they're going to spend forever chasing another PR. And of course, I tell them, you know, OK, you know, you're at a certain stage now where PRs aren't going to be as frequent. But if a if an athlete wants to give up because they're not PRing every week, then I don't want that athlete because yeah. they're not going to have the tenacity and the mental strength to survive a whole year without a PR. Like I want the athletes that are going to come in and fight every day, whether they PR or not. So I don't have that conversation. If they want to give up because they're not PRing every week, then they're weak. Like they, they're, they're giving up. That means they only, they were only chasing the thrill of PRing every week and they're not willing to put in the work to, to continue that progress. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And looking at kind of your programming philosophy, uh, you were talking about technique sessions with like advanced lifters and then more beginner set, uh, uh, lifters. How much does your program change throughout, say, like an eight or 12 week period? Um, when you write something, is it is it relatively set in stone or do you find there's a lot of flexibility with the Olympic lifts or the strength work? Um, what's what's think, kind of like your, your programming philosophy? I think, I mean, a lot of coaches do write whole blocks at a time, like 12 week blocks at a time or eight weeks. I don't do that. I mean, I have a general idea of what we're going to do for the next however many weeks, but I go week by week. So, um, meaning I know what we're going to do for this cycle. Like, okay, we're going to, you know, focus on this or this or this, but I only send my athletes their program every week. So I send it to them every Sunday so that I can make adju adjustments accordingly based on how that last week went. Okay. And will there normally be changes to exercises or is it? changes to maybe the the load or the weight or the sets and reps or a combination? Um, no, my, you know, I don't, I don't really change the exercises. No, because you have to, you have to be, I believe that you have to stick with something for a while to get better at it. Like, let's say you don't want to one Monday snatch triples and then the next Monday, all of a sudden, you're doing hang snatches. And then the next Monday, you're doing snatches from the knee. And then the next Monday, you don't even snatch. And then the next Monday, you're overhead squatting. Like, that's not going to – you have to have some kind of progression, period. You know, you have, to, you have to go through some linear progressions. And so, you know, weightlifting programs get boring because you're like, okay, every Wednesday, this is what I do. Every Thursday, this is what I do. I mean, of course it changes up. You go from doing triples to doubles to singles or, you know, things change up a little bit, but the general structure remains. Okay. And I'm assuming that's a little more flexible depending on how far someone is out from competition. Obviously, if, if you're writing uh, like a peaking program, there's going to be a lot less, a lot less change going on throughout the um, whatever week uh, period than if you're 20 or 25 weeks out. Yeah, of course. You know, if you're 20 or 25 weeks out and then you're like, okay, you know, after a couple of weeks, you're like, this isn't working. I need to change it up. Then you have a lot more flexibility compared to when, if you're only five weeks out. Yeah. And I was just curious because I know a lot of people, sometimes they get um, maybe a little anxious when they look at a program and, and maybe things aren't going well and they feel like they have to adhere completely to the program as it's written. But I think it's important to maintain a bit of flexibility because the way an athlete performs fluctuates so much on a day-to-day -day basis um, that, that one day you can be hitting PRs and the next day it's like 85% feels really, really difficult. Yeah. And, you know, what I tell my athletes, it's like, okay, so – and also I don't have crystal ball eyeballs. Oh, yeah. And so, like, I, I may think that this is what I want to do – but we get to that day and it's not happening. And I tell them, like, I don't have crystal ball eyeballs. I can't see the future. <laughs> this is what I expected that you would be able to do today. But guess what? We can't do it. We can't do 88% today because so many factors come into play. Like, I don't, I don't have complete control of my athletes, nor do I want it. But maybe they were up all night playing Fortnite or whatever that stupid game is everyone plays right now. And so they come in and they're tired and they can't hit their 95%. And, 
So I'm like, okay, well, you're not hitting 95% today, so let's go down to 60%. And you know what? We're going to make it the best fucking 60% of your life. So you make adjustments in that sense. So maybe they can't do what you had programmed. So you go down and do what you can do, and you make it really freaking good. You know, those are opportunities to work on movement. So, like, let's say a snatch from the blocks session isn't going well, and they're awful, and you're just not hitting those heavy weights. Okay, you know, 85 kilos just isn't in the cards today. Let's go down to 65 kilos and do a few singles there, and let's work on our speed, and let's focus on this. And, you know, give them a couple things to focus on so that they, your athletes are still getting something of the session. You're, you're still learning. Every day is still a learning experience. You don't have to hit certain percentages to learn. Right. And I kind of want to circle back to that training session where you were talking about, Mike, um, having you do so many snatches until you finally made one. How important do you think it is to have sessions where you push the athlete further than they think they can go or to a point of almost surprising themselves? I feel like that's kind of the art of coaching is is – changing the program to, to, to show the athlete that they're capable of something that they didn't believe they were, or, you know, just to have them work hard so they know they can work hard. Oh, I think it's so important. You don't want to do it all the time because you'll, again, that falls back to losing trust in your athletes. They're going to see something on the paper then, and then all of a sudden you're like, surprise, we're going to do five <laughs> more. And if you do that every day, they're going to come in and they're going to sandbag those the beginning because they don't want to do those five extra like you lose your integrity as a coach if you do that to them all the time you know but every once in a while there are definitely times where I've done that I've done it many times I've said you know what it, it but it, the thing here's the thing that day that coach Bergner made me do that he was trying to teach me a lesson and that lesson was to dig deep and to fight. And even if my movement wasn't there, to make that lift with pure grit. And there are definitely days that I do that. I will say to my athlete, I don't know what's going on in your head. I don't know what the fucking issue is right now or your major malfunction, but we will stay here all day until you make this lift. Um, and it just turns something on in them. Or there's times where I'll say, you know what? Stop. You need to stop. No more. Stop. Take the weight off the bar. And then they'll come back and be all pissed off and want to prove me wrong. <laughs> so they'll make it anyway. You know, they'll, they'll just like, I, I'm one more. And then they'll, they'll nail it. <laughs> it's just like, you're such an asshole. You could have done this 12 minutes ago. Um, and I think that that's, that's not something that can be taught. You can't like, I can't write an article and teach coaches how to do that. That's something you need to know how to do. You need to know your athletes. You need to know when you can push them and when it's going to be detrimental to your training because you don't want to be like, you know what, we're going to stay here all day until you make this snatch. And then now they blow out their elbow or hurt themselves or, you know, it's, more detrimental to their training than it was teaching them a lesson. So you have to make sure that if you're going to make a choice like that, that you're smart about it and that you're actually teaching them something and not just being a major dick. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because you're giving us insight into these candid conversations that coaches and athletes have that I think you, you can't really read about. And like you said, you, there aren't articles written about it. It's it's something that you just experience either as an athlete or mentoring under a coach that um, knows how to communicate with his athletes to get the best out of them and, and to teach them to, to, to work hard. Um, and and I, th I think these conversations need to be had more. I think sometimes coaches may seem a little off-put by the idea of telling an athlete, like, hey, get your shit together. There's no reason to scream and... and moan and, and and to whine about missing lifts like this is just another training day like let's let's prepare for tomorrow so I, I think it's important to take w what you're saying and, and as a as a as the listeners take it, what Amy's saying and to try and incorporate 
um, this more into the coach-athlete relationship, which is what it really is. It's a relationship that's developed over time. And yes. Yeah, go ahead. I, I agree. And you have to do it in a way that your athletes trust you. You know, like, I feel that my – I what I try to instill and what I try to teach them is – if I think you can do this, you can do this. So if you are unconfident or you don't feel like you have the strength, then you rely on my confidence and my strength. Hmm. Because I'm not going to set you up for failure. I'm not going to put you in a position to, to lift this or to do this workout or whatever it is if I don't have the confidence that you're going to do it. I am never going to... Put something on the bar that you're not prepared for. So, you know, that's how I go about my coaching. Like, if I feel you're ready for this, you're fucking ready for this. Because I'm not, I'm not one of those coaches that sets my athletes up for failure. I'm not going to put something on the bar that I know that they don't have in them that day. You know? It's just, it's just a dick move and you lose the trust in your athletes. And then you, you put them in a position where they're failing, 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 failing. And then they feel like shit yeah. and they lose confidence in themselves. And then the next time you get to that weight, they're like, well, last time I went to this weight, I missed it 84 times. So, you know, it's just not smart coaching. Yeah. That's, that's important to be able to instill confidence in them that they don't have in themselves because like you said if, if you put the weight on the bar like they should be able to do it and if they're missing it sometimes it's just a lack of confidence that they they don't have and you need to reassure them and have a conversation that hey you made two kilos under this for five singles you should be able to make this for one um yeah you can't just I approach the bar and half ass it heavier yeah it's a st it's only starburst heavier than the last <laughs> one I pretty much just stuck a starburst at the end of the bar. <laughs> um, it's so, true, um, though. And, I mean, of course there are times where I'm like, you know, for example, you you totally are, are ready to make 85 kilos, let's say, in the snatch. Like one of my athletes, she is ready to snatch 85. But she has to want it first, you know. And so there's days – it's like I'm not going to put it on the bar for her today because I know she's – even though she has the strength and all the skills and all the capabilities to snatch it, I know if I put it on the bar for her, she's going to miss it because she doesn't believe in herself enough to make it right now. And I know that about her. So a dick move would be to put it on the bar and just make her attempt it anyways. And then that just increases her fear over it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So if you're in a position like that, is it something where – you just watch her training and through the weeks, if you see that one day she's on and she's moving really well and she looks completely capable, you say, hey, let's let's give it a shot. Exactly. Okay. It's like Coach Bergner used to say, when the frying pan's hot, you got to do the cooking. <laughs> like there's a time and a place for it. And again, that's knowing your athlete and knowing when that time is and knowing when it's going to benefit them and when it's going to really be there or when it's going to be detrimental to them and scare the shit out of them or make them afraid. Yeah. And communicate that, Hey, just because the program says you have to peak in 12 weeks, if on week seven, you're looking the best you've ever looked, let's make a PR, like let's make a huge PR. And then if in four weeks you don't do as well, like, Hey, we, we won the battle on this day, which is what matters. Um, it's not that on test week you make a PR. It's that sometime during this training plan, you perform at your best and you're able to do better than you did before. Right. Okay. Um, so for up and coming coaches, I, I kind of consider myself as a, a, a beginner coach. Um, what advice would you have to help them develop not only the, like I would say objective side of coaching, but more of the art of coaching, which is what you seem to mastered or at least done, well, done a great job of developing. Um, I think it's just about lineage. I mean, you have to respect where you came from and you have to learn and grow. Surround yourself by other coaches you respect, um, read articles, find resources, 
you know, learn from each one of your athletes, like go into your, like learn from what's going on with your athletes and don't, don't pretend you know everything about everything. I'm constantly learning and I love it and I'm not afraid to be wrong and I'm not afraid to say, you know what, I made a mistake or I misjudge this or this is something I need to get better at. Um, that's what I have to say. I don't, there is no magic answer. That's kind of like one of those questions where an athlete's like, how do I become an elite athlete? Well, you really fucking work your ass off. <laughs> and it's the same thing about coming, becoming a good coach. You have to really work your ass off. Um, so with weightlifters, uh, athletes specifically that I bring on, I usually ask them, Hey, for someone that's on the cusp of qualifying for nationals, and that wants to make it to the next level and possibly an international level, like what advice would you have to them to take them that step further? And usually it's something like you just said for the coaches, it's just patience. It's just going in, putting in the work and it will happen over time if it's meant to, but but there's no, there's no real secret to it. No, there is no magic pill to hard work. I mean, unless you take a magic pill or steroids, (laughs) you have to, um, I think you have to take a look at why you're doing what you're doing and that, and use that as motivation. If you're trying to make nationals because you want to be an Instagram star and get more Instagram likes, it's probably not going to work out for you in the long run. Like you have to really want it and that's what's going to help you excel by going in every day and doing the work and knowing that there's going to be nine really shitty, awful days for every one good day. But the reason that weightlifters have a love affair with the bar and competing and training is because they strive to have those perfect days. They strive to have that beautiful, perfect, crisp snatch And if you can't like handle yourself at your worst, then you shouldn't be in the sport because you're really going to have a lot of bad days. And that's part of weightlifting. You're lifting weights. It's hard. It's heavy and it's frustrating. And sometimes we have no control over our own bodies, but you have to keep fighting if you want it. This is a this is a perfect transition. Um, I have like these kind of abstract philosophical questions that I ask every guest that comes on the show, and this kind of leads right into the first one, which is besides the physical improvements of weightlifting, so getting bigger muscles, getting stronger, getting uh, quicker. Do you think it would be useful for everyone to weightlift, and what has taking up the sport done for you? I mean, I think. It's different for me than I think most people because, first of all, when I got into the sport, it was 23 years ago. There was no CrossFit to introduce me to it, and so people didn't know what weightlifting was. It was one of those things where they thought we got in a bikini and posed on the stage, and so now people see weightlifting, and they it's fun for them, and they love it, and it makes them strong for their other sport, which is amazing because it either, you know, makes them a better CrossFitter or they use it to become a better track, track athlete or a better volleyball player, or they do it just for fun and because they can do it in their garage. And that's, what's really important for a lot of people. They can just buy a weight set and lift in their garage and it makes you feel healthy. For me personally, the reason I still lift at 41 is, First of all, it's because I love it, but I actually, (laughs) like I hate, I'm going to take a little tangent here. I hate clean and jerking because it's hard and it's heavy and I'm out of shape now and I'm like, oh, it takes so much out of me, but I still, for me, I'm a survivor of really bad childhood trauma and so for me to feel strong helps me be mentally strong. It helps me um, be a survivor. 
Mm. So that's why it's important to me. And there are people out there that weightlifting is important to them, whether they have goals to make a world team or they have goals to medal at worlds or they have goals to be an Olympian or they have goals even just to make it to nationals. Um, but then there's other people who have goals that aren't, that have nothing to do with competition. And those are maybe, maybe they just want to get stronger legs or maybe they want to get a better butt or maybe they just want to be able to have a hobby to do with their husband or their best friend or their children, or maybe they just want to go in the garage by themselves and they use it as their outlet, you know, or maybe they're an addict and they don't, if they don't want to take heroin anymore. And so they want to lift weights. There's a thousand reasons that weightlifting is motivating to a person and you have, and each person that's listening to this podcast, you have to find what your motivation is. You can't use my motivation or, you know, your celebrity or your weightlifting crushes motivation. Like you have to use your own motivation. Yeah, and I know Jilly Jaworski. I actually had her on the podcast. Um, you can listeners can go back and find that it's like episode twenty nine through thirty one. But she told me that she has all of her lifters when they come into the gym for a training session write down why they're there, so why they showed up in the first place. And I think it's important, maybe not every session, but at least to consider why you do go to the gym to train. I mean, some people just show up because they feel like they need to, but. There has to be a why um, yeah. to, to keep you pushing through the tough times that we're talking about, through those nine out of ten sessions that just suck. And the reward's not always going to be the one. It's going to be that you just showed up and did the work. Sometimes that's satisfaction enough, at least for myself. But you need to have a, an understanding of why you're in the sport. Um, and, 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 and maybe it's like you said, there are so many different reasons. But as, as long as you know, it, it's incredibly important. Um, yeah, there's no wrong why, right? And there's, and you don't have to explain your why to anybody. There's no wrong why there's just do it because you want to do it. And, but you have to have, a, you have to have a reason. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that motivates you or it's just going to get stagnant and boring. And then you're going to end up hating it. Yeah. Um, and, and something you said when you, you said that when you train, you just feel strong and, and then mentally you feel stronger. And, you know, I don't know if, if someone doesn't lift weights or, or compete in, uh, in weightlifting, it's, it's hard to know that, but when you feel strong, it just changes the way you operate on a day to day basis outside of the gym. Like I know when I'm hitting PRs and feeling strong or just, just putting in a lot of good work, um, in the gym. It just changes your whole persona. It's it's just something about yeah. it. There's like this this weird aura you have when you're walking around and interacting with people that bleeds from from person to person that you talk to and, and, and that you touch on a daily basis. Really? Um, um, so the next question I have is, what is the worst mistake you've made as an athlete? And then the second part of that is as a coach. Uh... What is the worst mistake I've made as an athlete? Yeah. I don't, I don't think I, I don't know. Probably missing my first lift at a competition. I, I didn't even, I, when I first started coaching weightlifting at, at nationals and stuff, I called my coach Bob and I said, I am so sorry for ever missing my first snatch. <laughs> I ever coached before this I would have known what I put you through and I'm so sorry so that's probably my biggest mistake and then um, oh, my okay. biggest mistake as a coach is um getting complacent with what I feel my athlete needed and not directly going to the athlete and saying hey is this still what you need do you need you know what do you need and so um I learned quite a while ago that you're as a coach, your athletes have voices and they really need to use them. And sometimes they stop. They don't communicate out of respect because they don't want to speak up and say, Hey, you know, I really need this or can we do this or whatever, or whatever it may be. 
Um, and I, and, and so now I make it a point to check in with them every once in a while, like, Hey, is there anything you need for your confidence? Or are you feeling that you're missing something, you know, because they're the athlete and I, and it's so silly that I forgot to do that as a coach because as an athlete, I used to do that. I used to tell Bob, Bob, I need to do jump squats once a week. I don't care when I do them. I don't care if they don't do shit for me, but they make me feel strong and explosive. And so it's something that I need mentally. And I used to tell them that, like, put them in wherever you want. I'll come in a second session to do them on their own. Just I need to do them once a week. And so I was able to speak up and say something that I needed. So it's silly to me that I never thought to say, hey, is there something you need? <laughs> you know, if, a, if an athlete was keeping quiet about that. Yeah, that, that really hits home. I actually feel like, you know, as a coach, you almost buy into your own, um, your own philosophy and your own approach so much that you forget that the, the athlete has a say and should slightly direct what you're doing depending on their needs. Um, that, thank you for that because now I'm going to ask everyone that I, I work with, hey, hey, how are you doing? What do you need? Do you feel like there's anything that can maybe help you perform a bit better or just feel more comfortable lifting? Um, so that's, that's really, yeah. really good. Um, and then the last question, this is kind of like the, the, um, climax of the show. It's, it's the question that I feel is, is sort of, um, most practical and is a little difficult to answer, but what is one thing that people can do each day to better their life? Um, to like better their life or to be a better person. I think, I think to, I think something, somebody, something somebody can do every day to better their life is to be a better person. Like what did I do today to be a good person? Because if you, especially like athletes, coaches, anyone, if you can be a better person, you're going to be a better athlete. You're going to be a better coach. You're going to be a better person in society, in society, a better wife or a better husband, you know? And so kind of take a look and, and around and be like, what did I do today to be a better person? Mm. You know, for example, let me give you a couple examples of me. And I'm, and I'm not saying this because I'm trying to like be like, look at how amazing I am or anything, but it's because it's my story and I don't want to, I don't want to say things that my athletes do, you know, to be better people because that's their story and I'm not going to, you know, put it out there for everyone to listen to. But something that we try to do and like that, it's something I try to teach my daughter is she just went through her clothes um, that were all over her floor and piled on her closet floor. And we have a bunch of bags of clothes that we're taking to the homeless shelter today, to the women's shelter. And so that's something that, she's doing to be a better person or you know maybe you're in the coffee shop and you say wow I really like your hair you know to the girl who has pink hair just something that's something good you do something good that makes you better and the more better people in this world like how lucky will we be yeah, it's a, it's a domino effect uh, for sure, and and I, I think recognizing that, and I, I had this discussion with someone uh, yesterday. It's recognizing the impact you have when you talk to someone because um, I had someone that was doing squats, and I was telling her how good of a job she's doing and how much potential she has, um, and and like I, I think just taking a t a moment to reflect on the impact your words have on other people, and then how you impact their mood and, and then how they impact other people because of that. Exactly. Um, sometimes we get so caught up in, in what we say and what we do, but you have to almost think about how that influences your outer circle and then how that influences their outer circle. So that's, that's a great answer. Um, well, it's something that's important to me is, you know, especially for my athletes is they spend so much time every day being a better athlete to shape their life to be a better athlete. 
you know, they train, they do their recovery, they do their Norma tech, they get a massage, they get this, they, they do so much to be the best athlete they can be. But I don't want them to get so lost in that, that they forget to do things to make themselves a better person. So what can you do to become a better person while you're also becoming a better athlete? Can you journal? Can you help someone today? Can you offer advice? Can you tell someone they're pretty? Um, you know, what can you do to become better? Can you maybe start taking a class online and, and go to school? Um, can you volunteer somewhere? So those things are important to me because when the athletics are gone and this is all said and done, what else do they have? And so I want to shape their lives to where they're learning to become better people and better athletes. Yeah, I remember listening to a podcast with Jared Fleming and he was talking about how he struggled when he was he he was injured and he realized that he wouldn't be able to become a competitive weightlifter and compete at the same level anymore. And I think it's hard for all of us as athletes to recognize the fact that eventually our competitive careers are going to be over and we can't identify as being a weightlifter anymore, like a competitive weightlifter. And yeah. that's that's always what I want to try and gather from people that have been in the sport for a very long time and have had to make that transition. So Amy, for you, when you realized that your competitive days were over, what kind of softened that transition um, from, from weightlifter now to coach? Well, I actually ended my, my weightlifting career purposely mm. so that I had more time to devote to my athletes. Okay. So... Yeah, I didn't I didn't get to a situation where my weightlifting career was over and then I was like, "Oh shoot, what am I going to do?" I had just made a world team at the same time that I was training China Cho to get her ready for regionals. And I realized like that training myself was the time that I was taking in the gym for myself to train for worlds was time that I could be giving to her to make her better, to make her dreams come true. And I was training other athletes at the time too, but I'm just using her as an example um, because she was trying to make it back to the CrossFit Games after a couple years of not going. And every time I was in the gym training for myself and trying to get myself ready for worlds, I felt selfish. Like I was taking directly taking time and energy away from her. And so I made the choice to stop competing so that I could be better for my athletes. So have you ever experienced a situation where an athlete was that you've been working with was kind of towards the end of their career and you had to have a discussion about what is best for them heading forward? No, we haven't. I haven't approached that yet. Like all of the athletes, I mean, no, okay. all my athletes are still going. I mean, you can have a career in weightlifting for 10 years. Or more. Yeah. I mean, I do have some master's athletes, but I've never had an athlete who like got so injured they can't compete anymore or anything like that. Okay. Um, and, and kind of, I guess, thinking abstractly, would you have anyone to say that's kind of in a situation where th they're faced with the, the kind of the, the identity loss of and maybe not even for weightlifting, but just identifying with something and then having that be removed from their life? I mean, I think that they do. I do have some situations on that, but I'm not willing to share those personal things about my athlete on a podcast because it's something that's between us. And, and, it, and of course, when you have an athlete struggling with those kind of identity things, it's not something they want to be known. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, well, as far as the like the formal questions go, that's really all I have. Um, and then I'm sure this would be a great opportunity for you to tell our listeners where they can find you, um, any products you're currently working on, or any coaching that service, services that you offer. Oh yeah, that's nice. Thank you. On Instagram, I'm Amy's Two Cents, and that's A I M E E the number two and then sense C E N T S. 
And that's um, basically where I do all of my social media. I canceled my Twitter a while ago because it's just lame. <laughs> um, and then Catalyst Athletics is our website. I'm getting ready currently for the CrossFit Games in three weeks for Cody. And um, we're opening a gym in September. I'm helping Cody open a, a gym. So that's going to be fun. And that's it. That's my whole life story. So where are you guys opening the gym? In Redmond. Okay. Oregon. So is it going to yeah. be like a, a partnership or is that Cody's gym or how, how, how does this work? It's a partnership, yes. Cody and I are going to do that. I'm going to be kind of the behind the scenes, silent partner running the business. I will do some coaching there, of course, but then he's basically going to run the gym. Like he's going to be the face of the gym and deal with the coaches and all that kind of thing. Okay. That's awesome. And yeah. As, as far as your coaching goes online, do you offer that kind of to just general athletes or do you take a specific um, person on? No, I do. I do do online clients. Yes. Remote coaching um, and all skill levels. Sometimes people are afraid to come to me because they know that I coach elite athletes, but I have a grandpa. He's 72 years old. I'm not kidding. He trains three days a week. And I have, you know, two of my longest clients are two dads. They have, they only train three days a week and they, you know, mostly train in their garage. They each have three kids. So none of them, you know, I, I coach non-competitive weightlifters, people who just want to train in their garage for fun. And I coach competitive weightlifters as well. So I'm kind of, I don't discriminate. Okay. <laughs> I don't discriminate against skill level. I love everybody. And if Unless you're, you're a total, completely pain in the ass <laughs> to monopolize all my time, then I'm probably not going to want to work with you. If people are interested, should, you, should they just message you on Instagram or can they find yeah, the link on Catalyst? Me, they can message me on Instagram or they can email me at amy at cathletics.com and that's A-I-N-E-E. -E. Okay, awesome. And um, thanks again for coming on. I'm sure people listening to this are going to – absolutely love you and go get, give you a follow on Instagram and then go sign up for coaching. So yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm sorry, whenever I'm on podcasts, sometimes I kind of go in these tangents and talk in circles and I'm all over the place and I word vomit all over you. So if you think <laughs> that doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. Just email me or message me on Instagram to clarify if I sounded like completely rambling. No, it was great. It, it, it was great. And I've listened to your podcast and I love listening to you speak. And I, I, when I bring a guest on, like I completely want them to take reins. All I want to do is facilitate conversation. But as far as like everything else, like people are here for you. So feel free. So I, I think it was great. Um, guys, if you enjoyed it, go like, share, subscribe to the podcast, leave a review. Um, I'm told it's useful. I don't really know about that, but <laughs> uh, and I guess we'll catch you guys on another episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. <laughs>